New orders for U.S. troops stationed along the border with Mexico. There will be fewer of them, but they'll be staying longer. We always would say he doesn't have any breaks. That's just something that my sister and I and my husband have said for a long time. Decoding social cues on the autism spectrum. What new research tells us about autism and social blunders in general. And a San Diego burlesque show gives us a look at the art of the tease. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Some troops will remain at the Mexican border through the new year. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh says the mission to assist the Border Patrol has been extended into January. Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis is expected to sign an order to keep active duty troops at the border through the holidays. The mission was scheduled to end December 15. Marine engineers from Camp Pendleton and 29 Palms have been laying concertina wire and creating concrete obstacles. A group of Army MPs in riot gear also backed up the Border Patrol when they closed down the San Ysidro port of entry Sunday. The Pentagon is expected to drop the number of forces from 5,600 to 4,000. They are also expected to change the composition of the force. Engineers are expected to be replaced by more MPs and other troops. Roughly 300 troops were already shifted from Texas and Arizona to the California border, which has seen the most of the migrants. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. The White House has claimed there are hundreds of criminals in the migrant caravan. Today, the Border Patrol said it arrested a caravan member who served prison time for murder and robbery in Honduras. The agency says he is one of three men who crossed the border illegally last Saturday night. Still, there has not been any evidence supporting the administration's claim of hundreds of criminals among the migrants. The city of Tijuana has found a larger shelter for the thousands of Central American migrants hoping to seek asylum in the U.S. Nearly 800 have arrived at a former events hall. Asylum seekers have been staying in unsanitary conditions at a sports complex. NPR correspondent David Wellness says the incoming Mexican president is working on a plan to house migrants for up to a year. There are Mexicans who are resentful of the idea that, that uh, this government is giving facilities to people who came into the, to Mexico and who are actually taking jobs in Mexico, uh, and that this may be done at the behest of, of the United States, which is refusing to take any of these people. The new shelter is about 10 miles from the nearest border crossing. The city of Tijuana will stop providing food and medical care at the sports complex. As thousands of migrants continue pouring into Tijuana hoping to be granted asylum, U.S. officials say they'll have to wait months before their requests begin to be processed. KPBS reporter Priya Shreether has more. 21-year-old Milena Sorto arrived in Tijuana from Honduras four weeks ago after weeks of traveling with her two children. And now it looks like she'll have to wait some more before she gets the chance to talk to a Customs and Border Protection official about her request for asylum. When we asked Sorto exactly how the asylum process worked, she didn't really seem to know. I didn't know anything about asylum. I only knew that they were going to give us asylum. But then they threw tear gas at us. If Sordo asks for asylum at the border, she will be referred to a United States Citizenship and Immigration Services official for review. USCIS found that 76 percent of asylum seekers had, quote, credible fear from October of last year to this year. During that time period, they say it was the most number of claims they had ever seen. USCIS defines credible fear as anyone who has a fear of persecution or torture. They say the threshold is low on purpose to capture all people who might be in trouble. It's really ugly over there, and I wanted to help my family. Once credible fear is established, an asylum seeker is referred to an immigration judge who then decides if asylum will be granted.
In a statement to KPBS, USCIS spokesman Michael Barr says, quote, the extremely low bar for establishing credible fear is ripe for fraud and abuse. This is because once an individual overcomes this low threshold, the vast majority are then referred to an immigration judge and most are released on a promise to appear for a court date weeks, months or years down the line, regardless of whether they plan to show up. Department of Justice data from 2012 to 2016 shows that 60 to 75 percent of asylum seekers who were released from custody did show up for their court dates. From October of last year to April of this year, the most recent number is available, 22 percent or approximately 6,300 people were granted asylum by the Department of Justice. Almost 12,000 people were denied. No, I'm no, porque. Returning isn't an option after so much suffering in the journey. I can't go back. Whatever her chances are, Sorto says she's going to stay hopeful no matter how long it might take. Priya Shreeder, KPBS News. Border Patrol says three people are dead after a smuggling attempt turned into a rollover crash. This happened late yesterday on Interstate 8 in Boulevard. Agents say they were pursuing a truck believed to be carrying migrants who had crossed the border illegally. They say the chase reached speeds of up to 100 miles per hour and ended when agents put down a spike strip. After the spike strip, the vehicle ended up going up an embankment, a dirt rock embankment, a very steep uh, the vehicle went probably about 20, 25 feet up that embankment and uh, subsequently rolled over. Nine men were in the bed of the truck. Most were thrown out when the truck rolled over. The driver has been identified as a U.S. citizen living in Mexico. He's in jail on manslaughter charges. The surviving passengers have been identified as Mexican nationals. Mexico will have a new president tomorrow. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador will take the oath of office in Mexico City. Those attending the ceremony include San Diego Chamber of Commerce President Jerry Sanders and California Governor-elect Gavin Newsom. Southern California Edison says it plans to resume sp sending spent nuclear fuel to the former San Onofre nuclear power plant by early next year. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says some are still concerned about their storage process with radioactive spent fuel was nearly dropped 18 feet into a concrete cast. What was described as a near miss was found by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be the fault of training, procedures, and oversight by Edison. Operations of transferring those spent fuel canisters have been on hold since then. Edison now says they have made corrections, though, and have equipment to ensure a near miss doesn't happen again. They hope to resume transfers of spent fuel storage by January. But Charles Langley with Public Watchdogs says he wishes the nuclear waste was moved further away from the beach, where he says it would be less vulnerable to the elements, terrorist attacks, and the public. Now Edison says they have safely stored 29 spent fuel canisters and have 44 more to go. The company says it will not restart operations until new procedures have been proven effective. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Back-to-back -back earthquakes hit Anchorage, Alaska this morning. The first one measured 7.0 and prompted a tsunami warning for Alaska's southern coast. The second measured 5.8. The quakes fractured roads, made an overpass collapse, and put cracks in buildings in downtown Anchorage. You may need an extra coat this weekend. Daji Aswad has details about possible snow in the mountains. Wet weather pressing its way out towards the west here. Just some very scattered activity across our radar and satellite from the last uh, six hours or so. But we will be tracking another system that's going to be coming in towards California. Now, as we recap with the storm from yesterday, Birch Hill, look at that, almost six inches of rain reported. Panorama Point, about four, uh, rather 3.58 inches reported. Alpine, 1.77 inches. And at the San Diego Airport, point. 80 inches have been reported with that storm from yesterday. So we definitely got a lot of rainfall everywhere. What has not stopped is the rough surf. We're talking high surf advisory here in San Diego County and all the counties highlighted in the blue. This is going to last through at least your Saturday night. And we in San Diego County could be looking at 
oceans up to 10 feet, potentially even up to 14 feet. So going to be very uh, rough out there, choppy, and if you can stay away from the waters, do so. Now, as we head into tonight, plenty of clouds and towards Oceanside with the low 45, Borrego Springs with a low 48 and cooling down to 38 in Mount Laguna. Here in San Diego, cooling down to 56 degrees. Once again, plenty of clouds in the region and we're going to keep the clouds there. Going to feel cooler into your Saturday. Once again, watching a disturbance press in towards portions of California, Northern California. We're going to be looking at snow to the north in towards San Diego County. Uh, higher elevations, about 5,000 feet and above could be looking at about a few tenths of an inches of snow, but nothing that's going to bring any accumulating snowfall to our region. And in fact, tomorrow, many of us are going to stay on the drier side, 66 in Oceanside, uh, 67 in San Diego and 45 in Mount Laguna with some clouds out there. Sunday night is where we get that cold air really settling in. Talking about a freeze or frost potential here, and that could be compromising some of those sensitive crops. And we can see some icy spots on those mountain areas into early week. We get an offshore flow and that's going to allow for a bit of a warmer air sunshine for your Monday here by the coast, topping off at 67 in the upper 60s and into the 70s inland for your early week forecast. That's that offshore flow working in the 50s by Tuesday and towards the mountains and getting sun for your Sunday here across the deserts. Reporting for KBBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Jaji Swad. Uncertainty in Mexico for asylum seekers. SDG&E continues its fight to pass wildfire costs onto ratepayers and older homeowners become targets for scammers. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 830. With the holidays come parties, informal dinners, and lots of room for social blunders. So how do we learn to behave in these settings, and what's happening with our brains when things get a bit awkward? For insight, KPBS education reporter Megan Burks turns to some new San Diego State University research on autism. This story starts far from the holiday cheer. In third grade, now 17-year-old Brockton Harris was standing on the playground at school watching his classmates play tag. So he sees all these kids um, running from this smaller kid and... Oh, no, it was these was, bigger kids you running explain it. at a oh, smaller kid. Oh, they were running at the small kid? Yeah, like chasing the smaller kid. Okay, so these big kids are chasing the small kids, then what? So then I started chasing them and like, you know, yelling at them and uh, ended up sending one of them to the nurse's office for some reason or another. You sent five of them to the nurse's <laughs> five office. Them. Five, what? Like, these are kids that were like two or three years older at They least. were probably fifth graders and you were in third grade. And he had beaten up all of them. And it wasn't the first time he'd acted out in a violent way. He'd always been a busy, destructive, hard to manage kid. But Brockton was not and is not a delinquent. Like a lot of kids who act out, there was something else going on. I'm like, there's more to the picture than just behavior. You know, he would line things up. He'd take his toys and line them up in the room. Um, you know, had to have things in exact certain way. At age three, doctors diagnosed Brockton with Asperger's syndrome, now known as high functioning autism. What Brockton saw on the playground that day in third grade looked very different from what other kids saw. And I have been studying it for the last seven or eight years. Ina Fishman is a neuropsychologist in San Diego State's Department of Psychology, and her recent work helps to paint a picture of what was going on in Brockton's head that day. To get her findings, Fishman and her colleagues scanned the brains of 105 7 to 17 year olds, about half with autism and half with typically developing brains. And we wanted to understand how different brain regions communicate with each other. They paid special attention to the amygdala, which is this deep seated region in the brain that is responsible for marking whether the information, the incoming information is critical or salient, whether it's a, a friendly space or um, a piece of music that I just hear. Um, amygdala kind of serves as a filter um, for marking, literally marking for the brain, okay, this is important, I better pay, pay attention to it. For those with autism? This region in the brain had weaker connections, so it was communicating less with the regions in the back of the brain that are responsible for visually detecting facial cues, facial smiles, facial expressions, eye gaze, things that are really important for social communication, which happens to be 
an area of weakness in kids on the spectrum. So when Brockton sees these kids playing tag, he's not looking for smiles or grimaces. No, it was these bigger kids Can running at a oh, smaller kid. At the small All he yeah, sees like is a kid about to be kids. bullied, not tagged. And he goes after them. So then I started chasing them and like, you know, yelling at them and... And doesn't stop. Fishman's findings offer some context here too. During adolescence, the connections between amygdala that I just described to you and the prefrontal cortex, which really governs our behavior, strengthen dramatically during adolescence in neurotypical development. And we were really surprised to find that this strengthening of connections was completely absent in uh, teens on the spectrum. Um, and it was even reversed in um, the left hemisphere. Fishman describes the prefrontal cortex as the brain's brake system. So Teens with autism don't appear to be pumping the brakes as often as they should. We always would say he doesn't have any brakes. That's just something that my sister and I and my husband have said for a long time. While autism is a lifelong disorder, these weak circuits can be improved through practice. And mom Chantel says Brockton has come a long way from that day on the playground. And occasionally I will ride this to school. He still needs some reminding, but most of Brockton's rewiring so these days I is done on old electronics and his scooter. Brockton hopes to become a mechanical engineer. Megan Burks, KPBS News. That story was part of our series, What Learning Looks Like. To see other stories about learning at the cellular level, go to kpbs.org slash learning. Marriott is investigating a data breach that may affect as many as 500 million hotel guests. The breach involves hotel brands connected to Starwood Resorts. Marriott acquired that company two years ago. Marriott says hackers may have been getting unauthorized access to the Starwood network since 2014. The company says the hackers may have gotten the credit card information of some hotel guests. Job cuts this week at General Motors may be part of a bigger trend in the auto industry. Earlier, I spoke with SDSU marketing lecturer and bottom line marketing co-founder Mira Kopik for the Friday Business Report. So Miro, this week we learned that General Motors plans to cut thousands of jobs. Is this a problem isolated to General Motors or could it possibly be a sign of a problem brewing with the industry? You know, it's, it's a problem brewing with the industry, especially U.S. auto manufacturers. Several months ago, Ford announced similar job cuts. GM this time announced basically they're phasing out all sedans like the Chevy Cruze, the Impala, the Buick LaCrosse, and they're going to shut down f idle five plants. And idling is different from shutting down. They could always reopen them, but it's going to displace about 5,800 production workers. And as part of this $6 billion, you know, uh, a cut of employees, they're also going to lay off over 8,000 white collar uh, employees. And that's on top of offering severance packages to other white collar employees for the last three or four months. So all in all, GM is looking to cut about 15% of its U.S. workforce. Shifting gears, one of the nation's largest pharmacy chains has actually bought one of the nation's largest health insurers. So what does the $70 billion merger of CVS and Aetna mean for consumers? You know, this is actually an interesting one to watch because this is kind of a, an effort at really revolutionizing health care. What this merger does is CVS has been kind of a leader at really rethinking delivering health care to patients. They have 10,000 CVS pharmacies across the country. 1,100 of these pharmacies have a, what they, a minute clinic. So if you have a cold, a flu, you can go in and be looked at by a nurse or a doctor that's on staff. You can get your medicine and you're on your way. Their goal in this merger is to kind of help, is to make healthcare local and more accessible. They're looking to uh, make it easier for consumers to access healthcare, and they're looking to lower costs. And what they're doing is they're going to save about three quarters of a billion dollars in this merger, and they're going to apply it to providing better services at the Minute Clinic. So they're going to look at now, instead of just simple things, they're going to look at chronic illnesses like diabetes. They're going to look at more complex illnesses like kidney disease and treat them right there in that CVS store with doctors. And as, as opposed to you going to a doctor or a specialist or somewhere else, you can go here. And the combination with Aetna, what makes it really exciting is now all these Aetna customers can actually go and use their insurance at the Minute Clinic, not just at their, their doctors. 
Now, um, on to San Diego-based Jack in a Box, a fast food favorite for, for many folks. Many media outlets, including the Union Tribune, are reporting that Jack in a Box is possibly interested in selling. What's going on? You know, this is an interesting thing. This has been brewing for the last couple of months. Uh, back in October, the uh, Franchise Council of Jack in the Box, representing 2,100 out of almost 2,400 uh, units, voted a vote of no confidence of the current CEO, Leonard Kama. So this is a major deal. Additionally, on top of the franchisees not being happy, um, investors are not happy. The two big private equity firms they're investing in, in Jack in the Box, uh, Blue Harbor and Jana Partners, have been in negotiations with Jack in the Box management to make changes to the way they, they go to market. One of the problems that Jack in the Box has is they're kind of in no man's land. They're a big organization. They have 2,400 stores in 21 states. But some would argue that that's not big enough to really compete against the McDonald's of the world. Um, and, and so you have the last year, a lot of smaller regional chains like Sonic was purchased by Inspire Brands, which owns Arby's and, and um, Buffalo Wild Wings. So Jack in the Box, by being sold to somebody, could actually help Jack in the Box expand. Because Jack in the Box has been one of the true innovators in the industry. They've done a lot. They were one of the first to do all-day breakfast. They, were, they do a lot of innovative sandwiches. And what the franchisees are saying is that since the CEO's taken over, the chief marketing officer left, the ad agencies have changed, and they haven't seen the marketing support, and they haven't seen sales increase. So this is a big deal to watch, and, uh, but investors are very excited. The stock price went up 6%. Mira Kopik, thank you for helping us make sense of it. Thanks, Ebony. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, a major earthquake shakes Alaska, causing heavy damage in Anchorage. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. Now we're gonna get a bit racy. Earlier this week, Diamond Dogs held its first ever audition to find new performers for its male burlesque show. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando was at the Marrow to find out more about the art of the tease. Not everyone is comfortable on stage and an even smaller number of people feel comfortable taking their clothes off in front of an audience. Travis T is one of those select people. Actually, since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be a stripper. My parents have pictures of me standing in front of the mirror, just like posing naked and, or just running around taking my clothes off. And when they asked me what did I wanted to be when I grew up, I told them I wanted to be a stripper. Hi mom, hi dad. <laughs> Travis T is a performer in San Diego's Diamond Dogs. I would describe Diamond Dogs as a all-inclusive boylesque group, which boylesque is basically burlesque, which is the art of striptease done with boys. So. We do a lot of different types of acts, from hip-hop to very, very cheeky and comedic type acts. Okay, boylesque may not be Shakespeare, but it speaks a language all its own. It's the art of like strip, stripping, but not being so vulgar. Marvin Garcia is one of the co-producers of Diamond Dogs. Tonight we're going to do a, a, our first ever auditions. Ziggy Zig is the other producer. Now the pants. Yes. I was wondering how you're going to get them off. Yeah, those are the kind of things that can come up at a boylesque audition. And it's an important point. For me, it's not only taking off your clothes, but how you take off your clothes. Anybody can take off their pants, but how do you take off your pants creative, sensually? How do you bring a different dynamic to the way you're taking off your clothes? And I think that's really the art of burlesque, is how you're taking it off, not, boom, here I am, I'm naked, you know? So, um, yeah, it's really an art form. But sometimes, clothes don't come off the way you planned. And honestly, you have to roll with the punches. You have to make it part of the act. And even you can be comical about it and just be like, ugh, ugh. You know what I mean? I've had audience members, I've gone up to audience members and be like, can you help me? You know what I mean? The producers need to determine if the people auditioning will be able to roll with the punches and learn how to work the crowd. Just having a burlesque group with boys in San Diego is already different, so we're trying to really grow it and see where we can take it as big as we can. 
Currently, Diamond Dogs puts on a show one Thursday night a month at the Marrow in Hillcrest. Barbie Z is the hostess of the show. One of my focus is to keep the, the crowd entertained and pumped and make sure they're ready for the next performer. All right, let's give it up for your Diamond Dogs. For performer Ziggy Z, it's all about bringing them into his world and telling a story through clothing and props. Like an umbrella, like I did for my last number. So I like dancing in the rain type stuff. So I do like full on suits and using little props like this that I can easily dispose of, but still bring a little bit of that, you know, visual dynamic to it. As far as burlesque, I think it's really about not about being sexy and about being sexual, but more sensual. So kind of giving them that little tease, but still like, you know, letting them know, oh, no, this is not for you, but oh, wait, it is for you, kind of deal. Diamond Dog's next show is December 20th, and it has a winter wonderland theme. Oh, I expect a lot of fun, energy, a lot of creativity, artistry. Scream and hoot and holler if you do come, because the louder you get, the more they take off. So if you like to be teased, Diamond Dogs are ready to do the teasing. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Diamond Dogs perform every third Thursday at the Marrow in Hillcrest. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.